The water quality of natural waters are very important parts of how ecosystems function. In this series of videos, I'm going to guide you through the buffering chemistry of natural waters, taking the starting point here at Dalbetöderskog, just outside Lund. In the first episode, we're going to look at the data from some water chemistry samples that I'm going to grab. In the second, we're going to look at the buffering properties of the water. And in the third one, we're going to look at the charge balance and the concept of acid neutralizing capacity. In the fourth episode, we're going to focus on how to calculate the pH from the buffering properties, the A and C, and vice versa. In the fifth episode, we're going to focus on the ground titration, a method to determine the buffer capacity directly through a simple titration. The water chemistry in this stream here in Dalby Söderskog integrates the input from the atmosphere, both pollutants and natural inputs from the sea, which is about 25 kilometers away, what is released in the soil, the biological processes that go on, and the processes in the water itself. So, this is the first place I'm going to take a water sample, and in the next place is going to be a bit upstream, higher up in the catchment, where there's less influence from the soil on the water quality. We have now moved further upstream to this beach forest. And this stream drains a much smaller area of the catchment than the stream when it has arrived down to Dalby Söderskog. It's the water sample that I take here that we're going to focus most on. And in a few minutes, I'm going to grab the sample, return to the lab and hand in the water sample for analysis. I'll see you in a while. So here I am back at the office with the data that I just got from Department of Biology and their accredited lab. The data consists of four pieces. The first one here in blue comes from atomic emission spectroscopy. And that is a machine that determines the total concentration of various elements. And it's very good for metals specifically. It works like this. You heat your water sample in a plasma and then the various elements start to emit light and since each element emits light with the specific characteristic wavelength you can separate the elements and you can determine the concentrations through the intensity of light that they emit. The piece of data in green comes from an ion chromatography analysis and it's a column and you force the water sample through this column and since the various anions in the water sample got absorbed and released at different rates they will be separated as they pass through the column and at the end of the column there is a detector that determines how much of various substances that come through. The third one is from a carbon analysis and basically you digest the sample with respect to carbon and you determine the total amount of carbon and then through acidification you determine the amount that is inorganic and then you calculate the amount of organic carbon as a difference between the total amount of carbon and the inorganic part. And finally we have the pH and I'm going to elaborate a little bit more on the first piece of data which comes from the ICP AES that is the metals and I will walk through them from left to right. So we have two water samples and the first element aluminium comes from the soil. The soil contains a lot of aluminium but normally it is immobile bound in minerals. You have to be careful with aluminium because it's quite likely that a substantial part of the aluminium that's in the water is actually as particles. You cannot be sure that it has ions. Calcium, on the other hand, is present as calcium 2 plus ions. And you see a big difference between the two water samples at Dalby Söderskog and the, in the beach forest. Dalby Söderskog is about five times higher. Copper is present in negligible concentrations. Iron 
is in a sense similar to aluminium. It's here in the pretty low concentrations and we can be quite sure that it's present as particle. The chemistry of iron is quite complicated since it involves redox chemistry, but I'll come back to that later. Potassium is an important component in the nutrient circulation in the forest ecosystems and normally potassium is retained efficiently in the ecosystem. So it exists in low concentrations but we can be quite sure that it's potassium plus. Magnesium comes mainly from uh, the ocean in fact. It's a major component in seawater and it blows in as aerosol particles and it's captured by the ecosystems and it exists as magnesium 2 plus. Manganese is also quite complicated in terms of its uh, acid base and redox chemistry and the concentrations are very low. The sodium comes from the soil but mainly from droplets that blow in from the ocean. So it's part of the sea salt spray to the ecosystem and it's present in the form of sodium plus. Zinc is present in very low concentration overall. So let's go to the anions. The first anion is fluorine and fluorine comes from the minerals in the soil and it's present in low but still considerable concentrations. Chlorine is the main anion in both the two samples and it comes from the sea with the sea spray. Nitrate is given as nitrate N. That means that the data we get in milligrams per liter does not refer to milligrams per liter of nitrate but milligrams per liter of nitrogen in nitrate. And the concentrations are low and they should be low because if they were high there would be something wrong with the ecosystem. Phosphorus is present in quite low concentrations. On the other hand sulfate comes into the ecosystem through air pollution and it's present in considerable concentrations and the data is given as sulfate S. That means that the reading in milligrams per liter refers to the sulfur part of sulfate, not sulfate as a whole. Going down to the carbon analysis, we see that it contains both DOC and DIC. And DOC is dissolved organic carbon and DIC is dissolved inorganic carbon. And the numbers are very different between the two water samples. The dissolved organic carbon is about four times higher in dalby söderskog sample and the concentration of inorganic carbon is about 10 times higher in the dalby söderskog sample. And that is because of the differences in ecosystem function, but especially geology. And finally, we have the pH reading here. Now, let's try to simplify this a little bit. And the first simplification I want to make is that I'm actually going to take away copper because the concentrations are so low that we can simply neglect it. The second one is iron. We can be quite sure that the iron is as particulates. I'm also going to take away manganese, also particulates, and the concentrations of zinc are so low that we can neglect them as well. When it comes to the iron chromatography data, the only one that stands out as being very low is the phosphorus. So I'm going to take that away. So what we have left as major components is aluminium, calcium, potassium, magnesium, and sodium on the metal side. And on the ion side we have fluorine ions, chloride ions, nitrate, and sulfate. On the carbon side we have the dissolved organic carbon, we have the inorganic carbon, and then we have the hydrogen ions. So that is the data we're going to process further.